Buonasera a tutti. Permettetemi di sottrarre qualche breve minuto a questo importante evento per porgere i saluti dell'amministrazione comunale. Io sono l'assessore Luca Merli, con delega alla sicurezza e alla protezione civile e porto i saluti del sindaco della città di Perugia Andrea Romizzi, dell'assessore alla cultura Leonardo Varasano che per un impegno istituzionale fuori città, ma i saluti di tutta l'amministrazione comunale. Benvenuti a tutti gli ospiti, benvenuti in questa che è la sala che rappresenta un po' il cuore della nostra città. Per noi perugini è come essere nella nostra casa intima, la sala dei notari, spero che sia di vostro gradimento e soprattutto è una sala che ha accolto grandi eventi ed oggi, grazie a questo, a questo splendido evento, abbiamo una grande opportunità. Permettetemi di salutare, ma eh, non solo di salutare, ma anche ringraziare Angela Juit che ci onora della sua splendida arte musicale. a cui poi lascerò eh, velocemente la parola e permettetemi anche di dare il benvenuto ed un ringraziamento speciale e soprattutto un benvenuto nella nostra splendida Perugia a Margaret Atwood per la sua presenza. Non c'è bisogno che la presenti, eh, scrittrice di fama mondiale con nel suo bagaglio più di 50 libri eh, e lascerò oggi questa splendida, questo dibattito, questo dialogo in questa splendida sala. Non tolgo ulteriormente tempo salutandovi, ringraziandovi e lasciando la parola. Prego, si accomodi. Grazie e buon pomeriggio a tutti. Prima Prima di congedarmi vorremmo a nome dell'amministrazione fare un piccolo dono alla nostra graditissima ospite che è un, un piccolo libro che si chiama Perugia City of, City of Art e che raccoglie un po' la storia e l'arte della nostra città con un benvenuto caloroso a nome di tutta l'amministrazione comunale. Grazie l'assessore assessore Merli, grazie al Comune di Perugia, eh, siamo veramente contentissimi di essere in questa bellissima sala dei notari per uh, uh, l'evento di oggi. We're so happy to be here and thank you to the Comune of Perugia and Assessore Merli for letting us be in this wonderful space. Um, let me just tell you very briefly how this came about. Uh, in February of 2021, I met Margaret in a cafe on Bloor Street in Toronto. Many of you will know where that is. And we talked and talked and talked. And in fact, we talked so much that uh, f suddenly we looked around and they were cleaning the floors. You know, the cafe had actually closed, but we hadn't noticed. <laughs> but uh, towards the end of the conversation, I said, you know, I have this festival in Italy and uh, it would be wonderful if you came, it's in Perugia. And she said, oh, Perugia. She said, my daughter uh, studied there and uh, worked in, uh, in Italy. And, and so that's interesting, you know, if, if they could come with me. I said, sure, sure, we'll look after you. And uh, so that's how it happened and we're just so thrilled. Uh, and then I asked my dear friend, Eric Friesen, who has been doing the interviews for the Trasimeno Music Festival, since the beginning, to come and, uh, and interview Margaret. And we're thrilled to have him as well. Thank you, Eric. So let's leave the most important words now to our guest today. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. 
What a pleasure to be here in this beautiful place again in uh, Perugia, and especially to speak to my fellow countrymen, uh, Margaret Atwood. Just to a brief introduction before we begin, many of you will know a lot about her, but I just have to say, what an extraordinary life of accomplishment. I've counted 64 books. Oh. <laughs> we say more than 50. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> I, I read that, but I thought it was out of date. Well, it's like my age. We say more than 50. More than 50. <laughs> all right. And you all know that they are best-selling novels, there's poetry, there is non-fiction collection of essays and children's books. And many projects, many spin-offs from the books, and no falling off even now, because she has three new books out this year. You once described Richard Powers as a volcano of activity. Well, if he is a volcano of activity, you're a tsunami of activity. You really, you which, really. Is, which is worse. <laughs> well, I think it's bigger. <laughs> but anyway, you're still resolutely Canadian, still lives in Toronto, still passionate on many subjects dear to her heart, a worldwide following, including here in Italy, much honored. I don't know if I should say in numbers now, but I counted over 160 prizes. 160 prizes, including the Booker, and here in Italy two years ago, the Latis Granzane Prize, right? At least 27 honorary degrees. I don't know what you do with all those hoods, but <laughs> a much respected, of course, and celebrated public figure, literary figure, but also a warning voice, a prophetic voice. But at the base of it all is the writing and speaking and being present in the world, which she still is. And I'm sure you all have your favorites, I hope we'll get to as many of them as we can in the next hour and a bit, and we will have time for questions afterwards. So, Margaret, here we are in Italy, and I'm told you love Italy. What is it about Italy you love? Who would not love Italy? Oh, what's not to love? Don't start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you start. Yes. Uh, I first lived in Italy in 1970, but a long time ago now in a very small town on a hill called Anticoli Corrado. And what was I doing there? I was um, finishing my second novel to be published. And um, I've always loved Italy ever since. There were some drawbacks. Nobody in that town spoke English. My Italian was bad. And when you couldn't understand them, they would just shout louder. So <laughs> I've tried not to do that to right. people who were having problems with English. You, you don't actually hear any better if it's louder. <laughs> <That's very laughs> they were very friendly. Yes. They were as helpful as they could be. Right. And we were known as iscrivri, the writers. Right. It was considered an odd thing to be. So that was my first Italian venture, and um, once I had an Italian publisher, um, my first Italian publisher was actually the cousin of Valeria, and I can remember that first visit very well. We were in Milano. We had a young child with us, uh, and we thought um, we thought this child might actually go to sleep on time. This was wrong. There was jet lag. <laughs> um, but I remember that visit as being very pleasant. And every visit has been very pleasant since. Right. Because even if they can't do what you want or don't know what you're talking about, Italian people are very helpful. <laughs> Indeed they are. As I mentioned, you have three new books out this year, a book of essays and occasional pieces, a book of short stories, and a book of poetry. I want to start with the book of short stories. It has this wonderful title, Old Babes in the Wood, which tells you a lot about what's in the book, because the stories have mostly to do with everything that comes with growing old. Some of them do. Some of them do, yes. Some of them don't. Right. 
One of my favorites, the one that does, is called Bad Teeth, which is a story of a long friendship lasting into old age. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading to us a little bit from the beginning of the story, Bad Teeth. The beginning, yes. Um, you could set it up if you want. It's like. all true. <laughs> I can tell you later who this person was or is because she thinks it's quite funny. Luckily, she thinks it's quite funny. I was astonished, Scylla says, to hear you had an affair with Newman Small. He has such bad teeth. Who, Lynn says? I don't know anyone named Newman Small. Sure you do. He used to write book reviews for that magazine. You know the one, in the late 1960s. It folded after five years, and I was not surprised. What magazine? It had beavers on the front, doing undignified things. They were drawings, not real beavers. What undignified things, Lynn asks. She doesn't recall the magazine. So many magazines have come and gone but she's always intrigued by Stella's notion of what might be classified as undignified. Oh, you know, having sex, wearing underpants. It's more undignified not to wear underpants, Lynn says, though maybe not for beavers. They're, they're having tea in Stella's backyard. It's the second COVID summer. Otherwise, they would be in a restaurant or not in one outside on a patio. But at their age, you have to be careful. Zilla spreads raspberry jam on a scone as whipped cream takes a bite. But how could you stand those teeth? She gives a little shudder. Wasn't it like being kissed by a crumbling stone wall? You're hallucinating, says Lynn. <laughs> no such kisses took place. Zilla's own teeth are childishly small, geometrically even, blamelessly white, and all accounted for, though she must be pushing 70. She never tells her age, whereas Lynn flourishes hers. Clock up enough years, she's in the habit of saying, and you can dance on a table, provided you can still clamber up there. You can have sex with the mailman and nobody will care. You can flush away your push-up bras. Not literally, you wouldn't want plumbers involved asking how the bra got into the toilet, but you get the idea. You don't have to hold in your stomach anymore. You can make six kinds of a fool of yourself because you're a fool just for being old. You're off the hook for almost everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this rapturous applause. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Sounds like there's some liberation in growing old. Well, you wouldn't know, would you, Eric? <laughs> well, I'm getting there. You're just a youngster, yeah. <laughs> a mere baby. Uh, but just wait, freedom will be yours. <laughs> so these stories are such, uh, many of them, is not all of them, but vivid in their portrayal of older age, of loss, of memories. I'm wondering whether writing them, writing these stories helps you to face this time in your own life with courage because, you know, you face all the indignities, all the discontents of old age. Not quite yet, dear. Okay. <laughs> There's more to come. More to come. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, Does it give yes. you courage to, to... I'm a writer, you know, we just, whatever the material is. So once upon a time, I was having uh, a large bran muffin with Alice Munro. And she was telling me about something terrible that had happened to her. And I said, Alice, that's, that's awful. And she said, it's all material. <laughs> so it's all material. And um, we don't, um, 
We don't snivel over these things. We exploit them. Well, and that's wonderful that you can exploit them you know, for gain. <laughs> uh, you don't snivel and you don't whine, but you do have a sense of humor. Uh, Those aren't the same as sniveling and whining. No. No. No, it's not. No. And that's what makes it wonderful to read these stories. No. Where did that come from, your sense of humor? Well, I think you either have a family that has a sense of humor or you don't. So some of it may be genetic, some may be cultural. My parents were from a province called Nova Scotia, and people there tend to make fun of things quite a lot, although in a quite deadpan way. So they also like telling you really whopping lies with a straight face right. to see if they can get you to believe them. Uh -huh. I usually confess once I've done that. Uh, we lived on a farm for a while and I had an assistant who, was, who had gr grown up on a farm, so she should have known better. And we were looking at the duck pond and some ducks were swimming in it with little baby ducks. And she said, oh, isn't that cute? I wonder how the mother duck feeds the baby ducks. And I said, well, right under the water line, there's a row of nipples. And she said, oh, really? <laughs> you can do it to me if you like. Uh, I, no, I, I won't embarrass you. Okay. How do you... Um as I say, three books out this year. You're so prolific. You just keep writing. You keep well, it, writing. it sounds like three books out this year, but, but you're counting the paperback as a new book. Okay. Yeah, so it's not quite that bad. But you are prolific, and you travel, you promote your books, you go to writers' festivals, um, you come to events like this. So There are no events like this. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, you, you can put that on a promotion, right? <laughs> Margaret Atwood, there are no events like this. Very good, <laughs> very good. Anyway, you're amazing for, for a person of your age. Uh, Let's stop that, you, just, just, you, can just, you can just leave it at you're amazing, I'll take that. All right. Well, I have to get a little There's serious. There's one advantage. What's that? People, if I, if I start standing up on the airplane seat to put my bag in the overhead rack, people rush over. <laughs> to help you, yeah. to do it. They didn't always, <laughs> no. yeah, but they do now. Oh, Even my, when you were young? And oh no, we don't want her dying on our flight. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to talk about <clears throat> one of the reasons that you're here which is um, because one of the highlights of Angela's festival this year is a song cycle, wonderful, very moving song cycle. Uh, you did the poems for them, and Jake Heggie, the American composer, set them to music. Songs for Murdered Sisters, eight poems, eight songs, sung by the Canadian baritone Joshua Hopkins, whose sister was one of the women who was murdered. Three, three women were all murdered on the same day right. uh, in the Ottawa Valley by the same man. So Joshua talked to us when we were at Glimmer Glass and said, I would like a, a memorial, uh, like to make a memorial of some kind for my sister, but I'm a singer. That's what I know how to do. So do you think you can write a song cycle? And I said, I don't know, because you don't know before you've done it. I said, I will try. So I waited until I had finished the lyrics, which are not the same as poems. They have specific things you should avoid in a song lyric. We can talk about what those are, okay. if you like. Uh, and then I sent it off to Joshua and Jake. And I think they made one change request, which had to do with how that long they wanted the musical line to be. So we were going to premiere it in 2020, COVID struck, 
uh, was then going to be 2021, COVID struck again, and then it was going to be 2022 in Ottawa, and we had this convoy event, which blocked off all access to the National Theater. So we finally did it. You were there mm -hmm. in February of 2023. Right. That was for the orchestral version. That was a full orchestral rendition. So there's also a chamber music one and there's a piano accompaniment right. one. We're having the piano accompaniment here. It will be the European premiere. It will be the European premiere, yes. Yeah. I wonder if you'd read a few poems from it. There are song lyrics, if you prefer. Thank you. Well, that's, that, that's what they are. Okay. Uh, so, so the difference between a poem and a song lyric is that song lyrics are set to music, and in music you can make a line as long as you want it to be. Um, and also, unless you're writing a Gilbert and Sullivan patter song, in English you should not have a lot of polysyllabic words, right. especially at the ends of lines. Right. <laughs> you should also avoid too many P's, because they pop, and you should avoid, avoid S's coming one after the other. Lots of it's, it's a bit hard to do in German. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of S's in German. Right. There are quite a few S's in English, but not nearly so many. And if you have an S at the end of a line, at the end of the word, you can kind of drop it. You don't have to pronounce it if you're singing. Did they tell you all this? No, I knew it. Oh, you did? Yes. Well, I'd written for music before. Right. Yes. So I should just say that these are written in, like in Joshua's voice, because Joshua, the, the yes. brother of yes, one Yes, they, they were for Joshua to sing. So you must imagine um, the brother addressing the sister who is dead. And it's called Songs for Murdered Sisters because there were more than, there was more than one woman. And um, as they say, in the North, everyone is somebody's daughter. Right. And quite frequently also, sisters, you know, there's, if, if you're a person, you, you, you're quite likely to have a, a sister. Right. Less likely than you used to be, but <laughs> there used to be many more children and families, but mm -hmm. it's not hard to imagine many sisters get murdered. This one is called um, Songs for Murdered Sisters, A Cycle for Baritone, and the first one is called Empty Chair. It's very short. Who was my sister is now an empty chair, is no longer, is no longer there. She is now emptiness. She is now air. And you've chosen number six, which goes like this, lost. So many sisters lost, so many lost sisters. Over the years, thousands of years, so many sent away too soon into the night by men who thought they had the right. Rage and hatred jealousy and fear. So many sisters killed over the years, thousands of years, killed by fearful men who wanted to be taller. Over the years, thousands of years, so many sisters lost, so many tears. And the very last one is called Song. If you were a song, what song would you be? Would you be the voice that sings? Would you be the music? And I am singing this song for you. 
You are not empty air. You are here, one breath and then another. You are here with me. As you can hear, these are very moving poems. Well, Here's, wait till you hear them sung. Yes, wait till you hear them sung. Tomorrow night, Magione at the castle. And uh, I think many of you here already have, have tickets for that. Um, you talked about, I think you said Jake Hagee and Joshua suggested you change one word. Did you have any other collaboration with them at all? Did they just take the material? Did Jake just take the material and then set them to music? Well, that's what he did. Um, I think the other event that I should mention was when we couldn't launch it in 2020, Josh came to our backyard in Toronto, and it was autumn, so leaves around, and, and he sang the whole thing in the backyard with the music recorded uh, that he was singing to. So just for us, a little private concert, everybody who was in the house, including a four-year-old that looked at him and said, how does he do that? <laughs> <laughs> how does he do that? How did you feel? I know this is always the question, how did you feel? But how did you feel at that moment when you were hearing this for the first time? Well, of course, it's always a risk, isn't it? Uh, it's the same if you, if you have a movie made of your work. You think, either this is going to be really awful or it's going to be really great. <laughs> so that's what you always think ahead of time. Luckily, it was really great. Yeah. What is this animus against women that creates this kind of thing? I know you feel very strongly about this. You've had two friends who were murdered, right? Yes, I did. So this spoke to you very directly. What is this animus against women? Well, how far back in history would you like to go? <laughs> You can go back as far as you like. I mean, the time is yours, Margaret. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, people didn't know where babies came from. They thought that gods generated them or you got them from the wind or something. Anyway, women were very much in charge of all that and had a higher status. So they can trace part of that lowering of status to this big discovery. Men have something to do with it. <laughs> oh, we should never have told them. <laughs> but um, paleoanthropologists are also tracing in the Mediterranean area the lowering of female status to the advent of the cultivation of wheat. Really? Yeah, that's a surprise, isn't it? What do you need if, if you stop being a mixed economy, hunter-gatherer, um, um, orchard grower, and start relying almost exclusively on wheat, what does that do? First of all, or rice, rice, you could have the same thing. First of all, you need land. So not just territory, land. Uh, second, you can store a surplus because when you dry the wheat and put it in big jars, and you can see these in quite ancient dwellings, um, you, can, um, you can support a standing army with it. Unless you have surpluses, you can't sustain an army for very long. Um, so you need land, you need an army to get more land, you need an army to defend the land that you have against other people who want your land in order to grow wheat. And at that time, examination of skeletons, men start eating wheat and meat, and women start eating just wheat. What does that do to their skeletal structure? Makes it quite a lot more frail. Oh, not a good diet, just wheat. 
stay off the buns, have a hot dog. Um, and then, of course, in order to help you cultivate the wheat, because you start plowing the land, it's a lot of work, you need more children. Sure. You need more children. Yes. Okay. So much more emphasis on having lots of children, especially since a bunch of them are dying <laughs> from malnutrition because they're just eating wheat. Uh, yeah, so that's, if you want a food-based biological explanation, that's one. Okay. What that's about today? One. Oh, today. Well, things just, you know, you get, a ha you get in the habit. Uh, <laughs> you can trace this through the, through the centuries. If you want the absolutely definitive virgin, version, it's the three-volume work by Marilyn French called From Eve to Dawn. Get the free, the three-volume, not the condensed version. She's got everything in there. Um, she wanted to publish this in the 90s, which was kind of a low decade for, for uh, interest in women's stuff. People were saying, well, you have everything you want. Why are you still whining? Uh, like that. And she was having trouble getting, pub getting it published, partly because it was this thick. So I said, divide it into three and do it as a three-volume set. And I also actually got her a publisher in Canada. It's now regarded as a definitive work. But that's the Bible. And you see these things, it goes in cycles, I'm very interested in clothing, the role that clothing has to play in all of this, what you cover up, what you don't cover up, what's modest, what's immodest, that just varies from culture to culture, but it's always there, uh, as, it, as is the status markings having to do with clothing. Are you an aristocrat? Are you middle class? Are you a peasant? Uh, these are all clothing-related um, things which you have to get right if you're writing an historical novel. The reason you have to get them right is that there are whole websites devoted to people who get them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a farthingale, you idiot. Um, so people devote themselves to this stuff. Um, yeah, so you can study it. The 19th century was the age of the greatest gender-based dimorphism in clothing. Really? What do I mean? I mean that the differences between male outfits and female outfits were very great. 18th century, not so much. Um, you're an aristocrat, everybody wore the frills, the lace, the satins, the fancy colors. 19th century, woo, big skirts. Men went into the black suits, uh, and that's why in Henry James' uh, fiction, so much attention is paid to buttonholes <laughs> in men. So did he, does he have a good tailor? You, had, you ought to be able to tell by looking whether he had a good tailor. This is the rise of the fashion industry and tailoring as prestige sectors in society much to the advantage of Italy, I yes. say. <laughs> yes, very much to the advantage of Italy. Yes. Uh, so all of this is of great interest to me and has been for a long time because when I was studying, I was a Victorianist. Studied the 19th century. So you want to know about the rise of aniline dyes? Ask me anything. Okay. It was a bad century for children. The Victorians decided that, that children should not eat anything that wasn't white. <laughs> you can imagine. Vegetables were too harsh, similarly fruits. Meat was too exciting. And uh, that's why one of the reasons you have so many tiny little gravestones in 19th century cemeteries. 
They also decided it was a good thing to give their children something called gripe water to make them stop crying. What was it full of? Opium. They, <laughs> really? they stopped crying, but they also stopped eating. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's not funny. <laughs> but it's true. So yes, like that. Tell me again the title of the Maryland French trilogy. From Eve, E-V-E, -E, to Dawn, D-A-W-N. Okay. From Eve to Dawn, look up anything. It was typical in revolutions, including the American, the French, and the Russian, for women to have a leading role in the revolutions, but then to be relegated to the back seat once the new group was in power. Like, thanks a lot, ladies. Home you go. Out of our hair. I want to ask you about The Handmaid's Tale, the phenomenon that is The Handmaid's Tale. The novel came out in 1985. There was a movie, there was an opera, and now there's this... There was a ballet. There was, oh, there you was, imagine? Yes, <laughs> and now this incredible streaming series, five, five seasons and one still to come, right? So I thought maybe the best thing to do to remind us about this phenomenon is to hear a little of, of the prose from it. And so I thought maybe we would listen Margaret, read the first two pages of The Handmaid's Tale, which came out in 85, and then we'll talk about all that has flowed from it. Yes. I will say at the beginning that I put nothing into it for which I did not have an historical referent. Really? Yes. Uh, either an historical or a present day example or examples of the same kind of thing. So, having been born in 1939, I've always been very interested in the study of totalitarianisms, how they get into power, and what they do. And one of the things they almost, well, I won't even say almost, one of the things they always do is try to regulate women, and in particular, their reproductive capabilities. Well, they try to regulate everybody. Um, but since this is told from the point of view of a woman, um, we see that part of it up close. I give you Ceausescu just for an example. Some of you are too young to remember that, but I'm not. You know what I'm talking about? Romania. Yes. Nicolae Ceausescu. He. Yes, thought it would be a very good idea to make all women of reproductive age have four children, and they had to take pregnancy tests every month, and if they weren't pregnant, they had to say why. Figure that one out. <laughs> Men have something to do with it. <laughs> okay, chapter one. We slept in what had once been the gymnasium. The floor was of varnished wood with stripes and circles painted on it for the games that were formerly played there. The hoops for the basketball nets were still in place, though the nets were gone. A balcony ran around the room for the spectators, and I thought I could smell, faintly like an afterimage, the pungent scent of sweat shot through with the sweet taint of chewing gum and perfume from the watching girls, felt skirted as I knew from pictures, later in mini skirts, then pants, then in one earring, spiky green streaked hair. Dances would have been held there. The music lingered, a palimpsest of unheard sound, style upon style, an undercurrent of drums, a forlorn wail, garlands made of tissue paper flowers, cardboard devils, a revolving ball of mirrors, powdering the dancers with a snow of light. 
There was old sex in the room and loneliness and expectation of something without a shape or name. I remember that yearning for something that was always about to happen and was never the same as the hands that were on us there and then, in the small of the back or out back in the parking lot or in the television room with the sound turned down and only the pictures flickering over lifting flesh. We yearned for the future. How did we learn it, that talent for insatiability? It was in the air, and it was still in the air, an afterthought, as we tried to sleep in the army cots that had been set up in rows with spaces between so we could not talk. We had flannelette sheets like children's and army issue blankets, old ones that still said U.S. We folded our clothes neatly and laid them on the stools at the ends of the beds. The lights were turned down but not out. Aunt Sarah and Aunt Elizabeth patrolled. They had electric cattle prods slung on thongs from their leather belts. No guns, though. Even they could not be trusted with guns. Guns were for the guards, specially picked from the angels. The guards weren't allowed inside the building except when called, and we weren't allowed out except for our walks twice daily, two by two, around the football field, which was enclosed now by a chain-link fence topped with barbed wire. The angels stood outside it with their backs to us. They were objects of fear to us, but of something else as well. If only they would look. If only we could talk to them. Something could be exchanged, we thought, some deal made, some trade-off. We still had our bodies. That was our fantasy. We learned to whisper almost without sound. In the semi-darkness, we could stretch out our arms when the ants weren't looking and touch each other's hands across space. We learned to lip-read, our heads flat on the beds, turned sideways, watching each other's mouths. In this way, we exchanged names from bed to bed. Alma, Janine, Dolores, Moira, June. I, I, remember, I remember when the novel came out, I read it, and I thought, this is beautifully written, but it's a dystopian fantasy. Then, I think the penny dropped January 6th, 2021. Yes, it was um, 2020, actually, um, the morning after the election. Right. So we had already begun shooting the series. We started in late August. That's when I did that scene in which I'm dressed up as an aunt and I whack Elizabeth Moss across the head. We had to shoot that four times because I wasn't hitting her hard enough. <laughs> I had my leading lady turn around and say, come on, hit me harder. I said, no, I'll hurt you. No, come on, give me a whack. <laughs> Bam. Uh, yes, they added a sound effect. Anyway, we were still shooting. We were shooting in, in November. And on the day after that election, we all woke up and we said to ourselves, we are now in a different show. So nothing changed, the scripts remained the same, but the frame around the show had changed. It would now be viewed differently, which it was. And we launched it in April of 2017. And what am I saying? Yes, 2017, April was the first season, and we had a, um, a party, a launch party in Los Angeles with 
themed signs, you know, handmade on them, girls' bathroom door, guardian on the boys. And my agent um, uh, called Ron Bernstein from Detroit, a forthright person, the legendary Ron said, I hate to say this, but you were the only person who has benefited from the election of Donald Trump. <laughs> and he was right, because when the show launched, it was not regarded as a dystopian fantasy. It was regarded as, oh, oh, here it comes. And so it has been. Are you a little grateful to Donald Trump? No, <laughs> okay. I'm not. Given a choice, you know, have your show just be a dystopian fantasy and have somebody else be elected, or have your show be this really scary phenomenon with that president, I would certainly pick the first. Um, having seen too many wars, disruptions, totalitarianisms come and go. I would, I would pick the first choice, but that is not what history handed us. No. You're listed as a consulting producer for the series. Oh, what does that mean? Yes, my question, <laughs> what does that mean? Do I have any actual power? No, uh, because no writer of a book that is being made into a movie or a TV show has any actual power unless they are a participating producer. I am a consulting producer. What does this mean? It means that Bruce Miller, who is the showrunner, and I have conversations on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he, when we were first doing the publicity for it, he would say, Hi, I'm Bruce Miller. I'm the showrunner of The Handmaid's Tale, and I've got one penis too many. <laughs> but then he would say, but I hired a lot of women, which he did. He hired a lot of women. And then he very sweetly said that he had had the idea that they would all agree with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> They're people. <laughs> hate to break it to you, but they have differences of opinion just like real people. So. <laughs> and but he's been terrific, yeah. He's been terrific, and the reason he ended up as the showrunner was that he fell in love with the book when he was 19 and decided that when he grew up, that's what he was going to do. So when they were hiring the showrunner, who was in charge of really everything, uh, he talked himself into the job because he already knew everything about it. He had immersed himself with, into it. Were you consulted on, on how the story developed? Because obviously things were added. Yeah, I was consulted as the story developed. And I had two expressions of opinion um, among my others. My strongest ones were, you were not allowed to kill Aunt Lydia. And he said, well, I wasn't going to. And I said, well, you stuck a knife in her back and shoved her over a balcony. He said, she's in the hospital, she'll recover. <laughs> and then I said, you're not allowed to kill that baby. Uh -huh. Hands off the baby. He said, well, I said, no, nope, hands off the baby. You can't do that. And he agreed even though he could have disagreed. He could have. And it was shot in Canada. Um, yeah, a lot of, yes, a lot it was. Of it yes, Canada, Hamilton, Hamilton and Hamilton. places nearby. Was that, did you ask for that? No. Uh, cheaper. Ah. And uh, tax breaks. <laughs> right, this this determines a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and what a huge success. I mean, five seasons, one to come. Great reviews, great uh, Rotten Tomato Ratings, Metacritic. Well, I have to say that the people involved in it, it's not just another show for them. They're very dedicated. And uh, just to give you one example, the costume designer is a woman called Anne Crabtree. And she was meticulous. 
she really did try out 50 shades of red before finding the absolute perfect shade. And she was that meticulous with all of the other colors. They had to test them on film to see what they would look like together, how they would show up. Uh, you'll notice that the, the first uh, couple of episodes, he hired, as a director, he hired a music video director who had never directed drama before. But you can see how beautifully choreographed it is in those set pieces with all of the handmaids. They did some aerial shots. Oh, very, very visual. And here's a little detail that you might not have noticed. In the commander's house, there are some paintings on the walls. Those paintings are all from the um, Boston Metropolitan Museum of Art. The implication being that they were looted, uh -huh. that they were looted from the museum. And he said, we had a big debate as to whether to put the signatures on or not, because these women aren't supposed to be able to read. But we decided to leave the signatures on to show that they were authentic. Um, they're pretty illegible anyway, so. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> yes, well, they did. So then I said rather stupidly, so are those the real paintings? He said, no, 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 we, go, we got a guy in China to copy them for us. You know, it was like 15 bucks a painting. He just <laughs> whipped them off. <laughs> but I bet you can auction those. Yeah. yeah. They'll go for more than 15 bucks. I would think so. Yeah. yeah. You must be enormously pleased about how it's turned out. You know, having had things made over the years, your first sensation is one of relief because you know how bad it might have got. <laughs> so first you feel relief, then you feel very grateful that it was in the hands of such pros and they were so dedicated to it because this doesn't happen with everything. It's just that you can't remember the names of the ones that weren't so good. Right. They weren't memorable. Thank you. <laughs> It was like my first novel that never got published. <laughs> <laughs> now I have an agent saying, why, why don't we publish it now? I said, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> why would I do that? Your novel, The Testament, which won the Booker Prize, which is a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. That's, why, he, that's why he couldn't kill Aunt Lydia, right? <laughs> because she... She's, a, she's one of the three central characters. Right. And it's going to be made into a series as well. Yeah, that's so I'm told. We, we never say definitely until it actually happens. In the movie world, we never say definitely. Okay. We say, so I'm told. But the word is out there. The word is out there. Do we trust that word? Not completely. Things can happen. You have, or will you, if it does happen, have the same involvement? Insulting of course. Producer? What's a phone call here and there? Um, <laughs> the good part is that Anne Dowd, we are told, uh, will maintain her role of Aunt Lydia, in which she is brilliant. Yes. Yes, she came to England to help us launch the Testaments at the National Theater in 2019. She's such a nice person, you know, she's just a wonderful person, and then Aunt Lydia is not so nice. So she walks out onto the stage, she's Anne Dowd, this nice person. And then she does this magic thing, and turns into Aunt Lydia, before your very eyes. I think it's called acting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Very yeah, well she's done. Amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing. She's also the voice on the audio book, the Aunt Lydia audio book voice. Huh. I want to go to the third book, which has come out this year, the, this past year, the book of essays called Burning Questions, Essays, Reviews, Speeches from 2004 to 2021. One of the many, many themes which runs through these is your sounding the alarm about climate change. That's an old song. It is. Yes. But it's still necessary. Yes, indeed. 
How do you frame the challenge of climate change now? I mean, I can refer to some of the things you've written, but some of these were 10 years ago. I know. What about now? In the summer of forest fires in Canada that choked out the Empire State Building, um, I think people are paying more attention because usually with these things you, you don't pay attention until it's right there in front of you. And the reason for that is people have lives. They have a lot of other concerns. And um, if it seems gradual, you think, well, maybe I'll think about that tomorrow or later, or other people will deal with it. Um, so it is happening on the local level, I think, even more than the international level. It's very difficult on the international level because you get all these countries in a room and they all have their own concerns and problems and politics to deal with and who are they going to offend and what votes are they going to lose and all of these things. Uh, so at the municipal, the city level, the local level, the provincial level, I think there's going to be a lot more money going into firefighting equipment just for starters. Uh, so that is, that's a Canadian concern. We have an awful lot of forests. Right, which are essential to the life of the planet. So we're told. Oh. Are we about to find out whether that's true or not? No. <laughs> I hope not. But at least as I read these essays, you're not a pessimist. Um, well, pessimism doesn't accomplish anything. Neither does completely unfounded optimism. So I think uh, you have to convey to people that they are not doomed. I'm one of the things that interests me a lot, and particularly appropriate to this area, is a study of the bubonic plague and the changes that occurred because of it and how people reacted to it at the time. So there's a limited number of ways you can react to a catastrophe. And they're pretty much spelled out by how people behaved um, during that period, which a lot of people thought was the end of the world. So if it's the end of the world, some people think, oh, it's the end of the world. Might as well just have a party. <laughs> yeah. so we're all doomed, let's party. Uh, let's loot and pillage because and, nobody's going to stop us. So some people do that. So I think it's important to convey that this is not yet the end of the world. Uh, because if you don't convey that, people just give up. Let's have a good time while it lasts. So there is a book coming out in England in December which is by a data collector, somebody who does data. And she is saying, okay, things aren't good, but they're not as bad as you may have been told. And the data also says that because of the changes we have already made, things aren't as bad as they would have been if we hadn't made those changes. There's also a lot of private entrepreneurs and inventors turning their minds to these questions. We did a program called Practical Utopias in the fall in which we, we um, had interactive online participants. His um, project was to design a practical utopia, the material space, what kind of house, what kind of energy, what kind of food, what kind of clothing, um, where are you going to get your water, all of these important issues. So they designed the material worlds which had to be carbon neutral, carbon negative, scalable, that, that is cheap enough, and attractive enough so people would actually do it. Because if you tell them they have to live in this ugly house and wear this horrible clothing, they're not going to do it and eat nothing but tofu. Sorry, no. Um, so like that. And they did pretty well. And they designed the social part too. The, thing they, the thing, two things they weren't so sure about, police forces and money. 
People don't like to think about those things. They don't like to think of what will happen if not everybody wants to do this, or if they uh, have criminal behavior. What are you going to do? And also the money question. Explain a little bit more about the money question. Who's going to, how are you going to afford this? What's going to pay for it? Okay. Now, where can we read more about this? Because there's not much out there. Oh, there actually is, if you know where to go. So you go to Practical Utopias at a place called Disco Learn, D-I-S-C-O-L-E-A-R-N, Disco Learn. Um, but we're thinking of how to build it out as a, as a curriculum that people can use. And can anybody get to this? Is it, do they have to pay anything or join anything? I don't think so. I haven't tried. Okay. Because <laughs> I already know what's... <laughs> yeah. Well, I was sent a link, so I got on it, but I You just... got on it, yeah. Well, yeah, I think I you did. can find that link through Disco Learn. We're going to go to audience questions in just a minute, but I have one final question. It's a kind of frivolous one. I have it on good authority that at Victoria College at the University of Toronto, you had one of the most unusual autograph sessions you've ever had. Do you remember this? Nope. <laughs> when, when, what year was this? I don't know what year it was. Okay, what did I do? Well, apparently a student came along and dropped his pants and said, sign my bum. And you did. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember um, signed my arm. I signed everybody's arm. You'd think I'd remember the bum. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I would think so. I'm, I'm, maybe somebody mistook the word arm for the word bum. What do you think? Okay, well, I, I heard he dropped his pants, and well, you know, young bums are attractive, so I... Well, speak for yourself. I... <laughs> 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 he can't have dropped his pants very low. I would have remembered that. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe just to the point where, you know, you get a, a vaccination or something. Okay. Well, I've just heard this, as I say, but on good authority. On good authority. What is the good authority? Paul Gooch, who is the... Uh, well, he has a vivid imagination. He does. <laughs> he's the former president I know. Of, of Victoria. You know Yes, he's, uh, yes. Yeah. Right, so Victoria, Victoria College, where I was a student, and you currently teach. Right. Yes. I've it's heard a lot of interesting rumors about myself, so I'll add that to them. <laughs> Time for questions. Angela, how are we going to do this? Uh, somebody going to take a, there's a microphone here. We're going to have about um, 10, 15 minutes for questions. And please ask questions. Don't make long statements, okay? Tell us your name and where you're from. My name is Bonnie Lamb, and I'm from Berkeley, California. Um, I've been reading your books since I was in my 20s. It's a great honor to be here with you and to be able to listen to you. Um, I just want to say one short thing, and then I have a question. Um, I feel like you have given to a generation of women the wisdom that we have bodies and a story and that we should pay attention to them and observe them. And I really think that's made a huge difference. I think we have done that. And now we're here, and um, well, we're all getting older. and. Um, I am interested in your book, and I specifically want to know how you chose the story of Hypatia uh, to, to... Hypatia, yes. So the question is from uh, about a story in Old Babes in the Wood, and it's Hypatia in Alexandria, who was uh, murdered by a bunch of Christian fanatics of the time partly by being skinned alive using clamshells. So it's called Death by Clamshell. And uh, she is speaking from the afterlife. So what I've just, oh, I've known that story for a, a long time. And uh, she's often used as an, as an example of a, an early female scientist. Um, so I don't know where um, why I write stories about things, but it, it seemed like a pretty good subject, particularly when you study the artworks that were done about her afterwards. Yeah. She was 52. Uh, these artworks usually show a woman of about you know, 20, 
without any clothes on, uh, exactly what was the artistic interest in portraying this. And she sometimes uses an example as of a Christian martyr. Put that together in your head. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sort of, it's a story about one's posthumous life. There's a book called Dead Elvis, which is about what Elvis Presley got up to after he was dead. And there are actually more sightings of Elvis being dead, appearing in parking lots and so on, than there are numbers of people who saw him when he was alive. He's been very active. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Bonnie. Next, next question. Someone right behind you. Oh. He's had his hand up for a while. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell uh, us who you yes. are and where you're from. My name, my name is Claire. Oh, no, not. Yeah. I'm from London. Yes. Um, I'm anxious about AI on behalf of my grandchildren. You have an extraordinary capacity to imagine a future, are you, do, can you see an upside? Oh, to artificial intelligence? Yeah. Well, they, these are sci-fi stories that have been written for a very long time. Um, all I can tell you about AI at the moment is, because it's, a, it's an aggregator, uh, it tells lies, so don't depend on it. It's, it's good for planning travel itineraries if you've got a bit of time. It's a terrible poet. <laughs> yeah, so we, we did give it a task. We have been fooling around with it a bit. We gave it a task to write a poem about our bird observatory on Pelee Island, uh, asking that it include mosquitoes and mud. And it obliged, but the poem is terrible. So no poets need fair yet. So I think it, like any human invention, there's a, an upside, a downside, and a stupid side that nobody anticipated. So we'll, we'll wait and see, but will it replace human beings? No. It is another human invention. Um, might it do dangerous things? Possibly. And if I were you, I wouldn't get into a self-driving car. <laughs> mm -hmm. Number one, they have not perfected these yet. And number two, they're easy to hack. So you don't want your best, your worst enemy hacking into your self-driving car and driving you off a cliff. The first thing you need as a writer is a criminal imagination. <laughs> so, Think, what could go wrong? <laughs> well, here's the answer. Quite a few things. Yeah, so what could go wrong with AI? The answers are numerous. And uh, it's a hop, step, and a jump before they start regulating these things. Okay, we have a question. Uh, John Fraser from uh, Canada. Uh, oh, Doc and it's you. Oh, <laughs> Peggy, Ray, it's you. No, uh, I was going to be AI, but I got preempted by a, 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 a is better Elizabeth questioner. Elizabeth there? Are you kidding? She's that right up there. Why isn't she minding you? She, she <laughs> will be, and then you'll have to tell her to shut up again on my behalf. Um, I, I, I move on, moving on from AI, although I will tell you, I did put um, a question to AI. I asked it to write me a love letter in the style of Margaret Atwood. Oh, you naughty person. And it said, dear vertically urinating human being, is how it started. <laughs> but that turned out to be actually not AI, that turned out to be you. <laughs> anyway, that's the subject I want to go on, is the, is the gender games that are going on these days, the gen the, both, both the concerning ones and the ones that are reaching to utopia. I'm wondering if you had some views on that. Well, our view is that, that nature is a bell curve. That's our view. So two-box thinking does not apply to nature. So we can start right there. And uh, the second question we can ask to those who are determined to shove everybody into just two boxes is, how many people do you wish to murder? I think that's pretty direct. If you think that certain kinds of people should not exist, 
do you intend to murder them and how many? Is that a direct enough answer for you? It's an expected one. <laughs> How can I be so predictable? <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? There, yes, in the back. She held her hand up for about five minutes. <laughs> Hi, yes. My name's Karen. I'm from Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, and you've got to allow me my fangirl moment. I've uh, loved everything you've ever written. Um, but one thing that interests me is I began reading your stuff as soon as I was post-puberty. And I remember in the 80s when I was a young feminist and an optimist and a budding um, vegetarian and feeling incredibly positive and optimistic about the sunny uplands of feminism and environmental awareness that spread out ahead of us. And yet you seem to have in your writing a prescience about what was really ahead for feminism and for the world and capitalism's attitude to environmental protection. And I wonder why you had that prescience and understanding when so many of us naive uh, would-be academics believed it was all going to be wonderful. Well, because, mm, because human nature, what does that mean? Nobody's perfect. And in, in any movement, there are going to be the following things. There's going to be a push, there's going to be a pushback, uh, and there are also going to be idealists, opportunists, fakers, and criminals. Sorry, but it happens. <laughs> That's why I was interested in the reluctance of my practical utopianists to really come to grips with <laughs> What are you going to do with people who don't conform to your rosy views? Oh, uh, yeah, so just like that, and, and possibly, I guess my failure to believe in the, quotes, perfectibility of human beings, and anyway, who gets to say what's perfect? That's always the question. Who's going to decide what the perfect model is? Uh, Short answer, there isn't one. There, there are many qualities of human beings, and some of them are very useful at some times and detrimental at other times, and others are very detrimental at some times and very useful at other times. So why does nature prefer infinite variety? It gives a species more flexibility. What can I tell you? Yeah. Do we have another question? Right here. Graham Fraser from Canada. I'm wondering what you are reading now and when do you read? Is it at, do you set aside time during the day or is it a nightly ritual? Um, no, I have no rituals. <laughs> okay, well, to tell you the honest truth, I just finished a book called Stasi Land. Stasi Land is a book from the 90s by somebody called Anna Funder, F U N D E R, uh, who went to East Germany after the wall was down and interviewed people who had been in the Stasi, who had been ruined by the Stasi, who had had encounters with the Stasi, who looked at the records of the Stasi. Um, and it's a really good example of what happens when administrations get too big. Because by the time they were done, they had one spy for every 50 people in East Germany. One of the memorable quotes is, the guy who had been in the Stasi said, well, of course, our definition of enemy started getting larger and larger. And some people seem to begin to feel that maybe it was a little too broad. Because if you have an administration that's in charge of catching enemies and traitors, it has to catch more. 
Otherwise it goes out of business. It's like witch finders. Need more witches. Mushroom hunters. You need more mushrooms. <laughs> like that. Anyway, interesting study of a bureaucracy that got really out of control, among other things. And what am I rereading right at this minute? I'm rereading Stephen King's breakthrough novel called Carrie mm. because I've been asked to write an introduction of it for its 50th anniversary. Wow. What do you think? How does it, how does it hold up? <laughs> I think it holds up pretty well. I'm also interested in, in the moment at which it appeared. So I will have the historical moment in, in which it appeared. So it's set in 1979, and it was published in 1989. What had happened between 1979 and 1989? Ronald Reagan, rolling back of the New Deal, and the advent of right-wing religious fundamentalism as a political force. And what is it really about? It's about the destructive effects of hatred. So I'd say it stands up pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> and when do you read? When, whenever. Whenever? Yes. When All I'm, the time? When I'm not playing Twinkle Twins on screen on airplanes. <laughs> A new what? video game that I have now mastered. <laughs> now, why do I do these things? Demonstrate to myself that I'm not senile yet. Okay. Do you have a question, Angela? Yeah, well, I have one comment and, and one uh, question, uh, Margaret. I think of you often when I do two everyday things, things I do often in my life, when I'm walking through Canadian airports and when I'm on Air Canada flights, I think of you because, as you know, they, you see Miss Vicky's potato chips everywhere. It's Miss Vicky's. Miss Vicky's. And I read your wonderful, wonderful novel, Hag Seat, which is Margaret's take on The Tempest. You must read it, it's fabulous. Um, and so every time I am offered a package of mix, Miss Vicky's potato chips, crisps as we call them in England, I think of you uh, because you uh, had them in the book. And then the other thing, the costume for The Handmaid's Tale, the white hat and the red robe, I think I, I'm, I'm right in, in that you, you took it from Dutch Cleanser, which is a, a product that we use, my mother used, and I still have a can of it at home in Ottawa because I'm not often in my home in Canada. So there are a lot of products there that are very old. <laughs> and I still have some in my kitchen. And so when I get it out to clean the counter, I see this figure with the white hat. Is this, you have a vintage tin? I have a vintage tin because is this correct? That's where the costume came from. That's the shape of the costume yeah. and the scariness of the bonnet. Yeah. But the color scheme came from um, medieval and Renaissance painting in which Mary Magdalene is typically dressed in red and the Virgin Mary is typically dressed in blue. Uh, so that, that is the color scheme in Western societies. Red has different meanings in other cultures and it has multiple meanings in our culture, but that is one of them when applied to women. But you must have had Dutch cleanser at home then. Oh, yes. <laughs> terrified me as a child because you can't see her face. That's true. She's carrying a big stick. Yeah. So what is she going to do with that stick? <laughs> She's supposed to be chasing the dirt, but did we, uh, did we believe that as children? No. No. I think that's a good place to stop. I want to thank, it's just been an enormous pleasure, uh, Margaret, to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for spending this time with us. And thank you for all that you have done for all of us readers and watchers and theater goers and everything else. Thank you for being you and thank you for being here. And thank you.